Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Chapter 1 on the Humanity of Christ book by my pastor, Brother James W. Knox. And before I get started, I want you to know that this is written by my pastor, and I was going to do a reading today, so I did the introduction last time, so if you have missed that one, I recommend you go back and hear it and read it, and you can find this book and many others on the church website at www.jameswknox.org, and I recommend this book. It's a really good book, so <clears throat> today I'm going to be reading Chapter 1, Justified in the Spirit. This is a, a good chapter. There is uh, how many pages? We have 28 pages, so I am going to... To uh, start this, amen? So let's get started. All right, chapter one, justified in the spirit. And it says here in 1 Timothy 3, 16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed received up into glory. Amen. So that was 1 Timothy 3.16. And let's get started on what Brother James has written here. It says, Because of the opposition raised against biblical Christianity by the many cults and liberal religious groups which deny the deity of Jesus Christ, those who hold to sound doctrine are very well versed in the spiritual proofs that Christ Jesus was is and always will be God. He is the creator, capital C, creator, of the heavens and the earth. To counter those who would reject the essential truth that the Son of God is eternally co-equal with the Father, we proclaim in our Bible studies, teach in our institutes, and preach from our pulpits the fundamental truth that the Lord Jesus Christ is divine in every literal sense of the word. He is the Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the first and the last. By him were all things made, and without him was not anything made that was made. Amen. Yet, yet among those groups of true Christians who so correctly and certainly defend the doctrine of the deity of Jesus Christ, there is little mention and no discussion of the humanity of Jesus. This great mystery that God was manifest in a body of human flesh is overwhelming, frightening, bewildering. In fact, the Holy Spirit said there may be many points of controversy, but that God becoming man is mysterious, uh, becoming man is mysterious is not one of them. The Bible says great is the mystery of godliness. For while each of the biblical mysteries has been explained, this one continues to mystify. How could God become a man? Having become man, was he still God? Why did he become a man? Did he cease be being God when he became man, or did he cease being man when he returned to heaven? These questions, and many more, cause many to shy away from the doctrine of Christ's humanity. And then Brother James says here, If I told you that God was bigger than the heavens and the earth, as incredible as that is, and while our minds may not be able to take it in, they could consent to the truth of the declaration. If I said that God is the Almighty, that He is all-powerful, that His majesty far excels any attempt we might make to describe Him, Nothing within us rec recoils. We could not make God mighty enough to confound our hearts and our minds. But should we be asked to make God smaller and smaller still, weaker and then weaker still, something inside us reverently says, This cannot be so. In our spirits we reverently draw back from the idea of God being human, lying in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes, a toddler learning to walk, a boy learning to read, a young man coping with life, an adult laboring in a carpenter shop, 
a Jewish man submitting to John's baptism, a bruised, bloodied, and beaten preacher entering the door of death. This, that it, this is Almighty God is a great mystery. All right. So the Holy Bible declares in 1 John 5, 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. This triune being is the one and only true God. Of that we are in no doubt. But the scripture also tells us that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. John 1.14 it is that marvelous mystery we want to explore. Amen. The Word never became God. His deity is eternal. I am that I am is the name by which he described himself. The Word never ceased to be God when he clothed himself in human flesh. He was not 50% not God and 50% man. He was always God. Right. He has always been God. He always will be God, through and through, completely. But the God of creation, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Holy Writ, moved into a tiny human body in the womb of a virgin by the name of Mary. This is truth. It staggers our minds, but it is true. It is not hard for real Christians to think of God saying, let there be light, and light springing forth. It is not hard for us to think of God creating the sun and the moon and the stars and forming the very first man in the garden out of the dust of the ground. It is not hard for us to believe that God could do all of which the Bible speaks and all on which it is silent. John 21.25 John 21.25, let's go and read there. John 21, 25. Read some Bible here. Amen. Let's see what it says. John 21 and 25. And it says, And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. So, but if I suggest to you, Brother James says, but if I suggest to you crawling, God taking his first steps as a toddler, God sitting beside his mother and learning the letters of the alphabet, there is something inside us that says, no, wait a minute, that cannot be so. And so we do not think about it. We hear no sermon on the topic. We make no pursuit of this doctrine in our studies. If you believe that Jesus Christ was God, that he was always God, then he was God when he when they laid him in Bethlehem's manger, right? Then he was God when at 2 years old he fled his parents to Egypt or fled with his parents to Egypt. Then he was God when at 12 years old he taught the lawyers in the temple. Then he was God when as a young man, he worked as an apprentice in Joseph's carpenter shop. Great is the mystery of godliness. Our minds have never tried to ponder God making himself small, weak, subject to the realities of human life, with all its infirmity, trial, and hardship, but he did so. On earth, in a body of flesh, God was sleepy, hungry, thirsty, lonely, and more that we cannot discuss until later, later in our study. I say with caution, Brother James says, I say with caution and reverence that I can prove to you from the Holy Bible, if you will continue on, that we have the same God to whom Moses sp spoke, to whom David prayed, uh, whom Joshua served, Daniel obeyed, and Samuel honored. But he is far better better able to meet our human needs now that he has experienced life on earth as a man. Amen. That is so true. He knows everything that we go through. We have what Job longed for and could not find. We have the prophets foretold uh, we have what the prophets foretold but did not live to see. 
We have a God who understands what it is like to live and suffer and weep and even die on this earth as a man. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Before we finish, we will see that while Old Testament saints had a God who observed from afar, we now have a God who has seen, felt, and experienced life as a man. While once a high priest stood between God and man, we now have a high priest who is God and man, a high priest who can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. We now worship, pray to, confide in, and lean upon a God who has been on this earth in a body of flesh and who has been in all points tempted like as we are and who is yet without sin. Praise the Lord. We will see to our amazement and our joy that the scripture says we have a God who is better suited to meet the needs of man today than he was in Old Testament times. Let us consider one more verse as we introduce our topic. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. For 4,000 years, from Adam to Calvary, God was in heaven and man was on earth, and the two had almost no communication. That seems incorrect to some, but we will see that it is a reality when we overview his dealings with man during Old Testament times. Since God, the Son, became the Son of Man, we now have sitting in heaven one who is both God and man, and who is therefore able to represent each to the other and to bring the two parties together in his person. God came to man through Jesus, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, 2 Corinthians 5.19. Man comes to God through Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's in John 14, 6, that's Jesus speaking. There is now, what there was not in the former era, a man in heaven who is God, and a God in heaven who is man. In the pages that follow, we will see how this came to pass. Why it came to pass, and what it means for lost men now, for saved men now, and for both in the endless ages to come. Amen. All right, here we go, continuing on. While we have often heard it said that Jesus Christ came into this world to die on the cross for our sins, that is only partially true. If we say that the Lord had to die at Calvary in order to make sufficient payment for our sins, that would be correct but incomplete. Reading to first Timoth returning to 1 Timothy 3.16, we read, And without controversy great is the mystery of godliness god was manifest in the flesh justified in the spirit in order to rightly understand and fully appreciate the death of the son of god on the cross we must learn from the scripture when and how the holy spirit justified declared righteous the son of man let us start by comparing romans 3:23 with john 1:14 the former says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This is almost universally set forth as two different ways of saying the same thing, but such is not the case. There are two clues here. One is the comma, and the other is the word and. Both indicate that we have two separate truths which unite to make one point. The point being made is that no man has sufficient righteousness to stand before a holy God, but this is proven by not one but two truths. Fact number one, all have sinned. Fact number two, all have come short of the glory of God. Suppose a man is at work on Friday afternoon, and he walks into the office to talk to the boss. The secretary is not there, and the boss is nowhere to be found. He looks out the window in hopes of spotting him because there is an urgent matter to be discussed. Then he notices that lying on the desktop are the checks and the cash for the week's bank deposit. 
something unbidden and uninvited rises up within the man and suggests, why don't you take some of that money? The man is a Christian, and such an action would be completely contrary to the way he lives next. He responds within himself to whatever it is that made the suggestion. That would not be right. I could not do that. And no sooner does one thought end than another leaps forth. Well, no. The man immediately goes to God in prayer, asks for help and obtains it, and walks out of that office without taking the money. Amen. It would be a sin to steal. He did not sin. But the motions of sin inside him, Romans 7, 5, and the desires of the flesh and of the mind, which rise up within him, Ephesians 2, 3, show that even when a man does not consent to sin, sorry about that, it says, uh, what was I, it says again, it would be a sin to steal, he did not sin, but the motions of sin inside him, Romans 7, 5, and the desires of the flesh and of the mind, which rise up within him, Ephesians 2, 3, show that even when a man does not consent to sin, he is a fallen creature who falls far short of the glory of God. When one considers that it takes Christian fellowship, preaching, Bible uh, reading, the impression made by the right kind of music, the strength gained from the right kind of people, prayer, fleeing temptation, a conscience, and the indwelling Holy Spirit, just to keep a saved uh, Christian from sinning, we begin to see that even when we are at our best, we are far short of the glory of God. To equal the holiness of the Most High, we would have to go far beyond not sinning. We would have to have no voluntary or involuntary desire to sin. Hmm, that's good. So, if we are honest, we must admit that not only do we sin, but we also come short of God's glory. When we do not sin, it is because we have overcome our inborn tendency in action. When we do not transgress, it is because all of the forces brought to bear upon our life to keep us from failure have in this instant been victorious. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Psalm 39.5 Here, right. Next, come to John 1, where we read in the first three verses, In the beginning was the word. That uppercase W makes this a proper name. We last saw that name in 1 John 5.7, identifying the second person of the Godhead, and we have a little note down here. It says, when referring to scripture, word is always lowercase. When referring to the person of the Lord, word is always uppercase. Amen. All right. So, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. There can be no mistake the truth set forth here. God, the Word, is the Creator. We move ahead to John 1.14 and are told that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The Creator, who was in the beginning, Genesis 1.1, became flesh. The One who made all things took upon Himself a body of flesh. Incredible. Amen. Incredible. But the verse continues, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. God was dwelling among men as a man with his glory on display for all to behold. It fills us with awe. But we have to ask, how did men behold the glory of God when they looked on Jesus? The artists lead us down a path of error and misunderstanding. <laughs> error and misunderstanding which one is Jesus in the printing or in the painting look at the round circle of glowing light above his head <laughs> right do you see the halo this is supposed to be the display of the glory of god then it would be correct to say of other men for all their sin and lacked a halo atop their head <laughs> right 
others to pick Jesus uh, with an aura around him or with a glow light emanating from his body. If this, if that is true, then how do we explain the testimony of his first cousin, John the Baptist? The man who knew Jesus after the flesh for thirty years said to Israel, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. John 1.30 But it was not until his baptism at Jordan that John knew Jesus was the promised Messiah, for he said, And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. John 1.31 do you not suppose that if one man in town is glowing like a neon light that the rest of the people would suspect him of being someone special? Yeah. Our Christian movies lead us down the same trail. And Brother says, I do not know if they show films about Jesus on television anymore, but when I was a boy, the TV networks would show a movie about Jesus at Christmas time and Easter time. Wow, that is far better than growing up in a land that might show a film about Muhammad, Santa Claus, or some other false religious leader. There was much in those movies that was highly inaccurate, and those things remain in one's mind and create false notions. That is the truth. For example, according to those movies in Jesus' time, everybody in Palestine wore dingy brown robes. But Jesus had a white one <laughs> with a blue s sash. <laughs> yeah. And we have another uh, little note down here. If it was a Catholic movie, Mary also had the white robe. Hmm. All of these are attempts to depict the glory of the Lord as something having to do with the way he looked. Yet, when we finish John 1.14, we read, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The glory of the Lord was on display in his words and in his deeds. He never sinned, as all other men do sin. He never once came short of the glory of God, as all other men come short. He was full of grace within and without. He was wholly true, without and within the unspotted holiness and the absolute righteousness of God were on display for all to see in the person of Jesus Christ. As a child, he was without blemish. As a teen, he is undefiled. As a young man, he is pure. As an adult, his thoughts, impulses, desires, words, and ways were fully righteous. Every moment of every day, he is not just living without sin, but living as the manifestation of the glory of God. So, while it is true that Jesus came to die on the cross to pay for all the sins of all the sinners, that sacrifice comes later. He could have arrived as a full-grown man, fulfilled the prophecy regarding his death in a week or so, and gone to the cross. But... For four thousand years, every man born of a woman had failed to please a holy God, had violated his commandments, and had tres trespassed against him. When confronted or convicted, their foolish hearts could say, This is not fair. No one could obey all of these rules. So the Son of Man came to live as a man under God, under God's decree, in the midst of a world full of trouble and sin. And he did so without ever coming short of the full measure of the glory of God. Amen. We turn next to Isaiah 53, verses 1 and 2, and read of the body in which the Son of God took up residence. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. You might be a farming man, a lady with a flower bed, or a grandpa with a garden. But if you have tried to make any plant grow to full strength and beauty, you know that the soil must be fertile. 
In the parable of the sower, we learn that the best of seed is of no value if it falls upon unfit ground. Should the seed fall into dry ground, lacking sufficient moisture, and should the roots reach forth into soil, which provides them little nourishment, then the plant will lack proper form and color and will be far from attractive. The Holy Spirit uses this common illustration to tell us of the coming of the Lord into this world, into a place of sin, rebellion, wickedness, and vice, came one who was all virtue, honor, purity, and love. It would border on the miraculous if such a tender plant could produce the fruit of the Spirit after being planted in such barren soil. The verses at hand say concerning the physical appearance of Jesus Christ that when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. This is extremely important. We are speaking of the humanity of the word. As a man, he lacks form. As a man, he lacks comeliness. As a man, he is without physical beauty. There is nothing desirable about his appearance. We have all seen the pictures of Jesus hanging in church buildings and people's living rooms and on the front of hymnals. The uh, depiction is of a beautiful man, strong and feminine at the same time. His features are obviously European, the strong Roman nose and the blue Germanic eyes, with the long flowing hair that any woman would envy. <laughs> seeing such a picture would come almost... Uh, uh, seeing such a picture one could almost imagine the blasphemous tales of his being fathered by a Roman soldier were true. The idea of such work is to make Jesus desirable to the eye of men and women so they are drawn to his physical beauty. That is not him. The Bible says there was nothing in his physical appearance that would cause us to desire him. And yet, multitudes of both men and women followed him. Amen. They loved him. They forsook all to be with him. They ministered to him of their substance. They literally poured their treasures at his feet and gave him their last might. They were willing to lay down their lives for him. This is mysterious. We must proceed with caution, for I have no desire to offend. Advers uh, advertisers want you to draw uh, you drawn to their product, so it is offered to you by people who are physically beautiful. In these days of video and internet, a great singer or musician has no access to fame if they do not have the looks to equal or surpass their talent. That's true. Should one desire to uh, one aspire to a political office? He will climb no higher than his appearance will allow. Crowds do not follow mediocre, uh, and they do show, and they sure do not flock to ugly. That is the sad reality. Yet the word of God says that Jesus had no physical appeal, but he was thronged by those who wanted to see him, hear him, or touch him. How could this be? Look at Exodus 28:1-4. And take thou unto thee Aaron, thy brother, and his sons with him, from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Even Aaron, or Aaron, Yeb and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron, thy brother, for glory and for beauty. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, and an ephod, and a robe, and a broided coat, and a mitre, and a girdle. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron's Aaron thy brother and his sons, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Aaron was a common, ordinary man, just one fellow out of all the children of Israel. 
God chose to make him the high priest to stand for the people in his presence. He did not choose Aaron because he was beautiful, but having chosen him, he made him beautiful. This was done not by altering his physical features, but by adorning him with glory, and the glory made him beautiful. Amen. What was this glory? Holiness. These holy garments provide glory, which resulted in beauty. If we could go back in time and look at the actual body, face, hair, eyes, nose, or lips of Jesus, there would be no beauty that we should desire him. But the Holy Spirit bids us look again with the spiritual eye. Now we see that he is full of grace. He is full of truth. He is full of mercy. He is full of compassion. He is full of righteousness. We observe that he is pure. He is spotless. He is undefiled. And the spiritual man cries out from the depths of his heart, Why, he is beautiful. He is altogether lovely. I would follow him anywhere. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. God the Father planted God the Son in the dry ground of a sinful world where we beheld his glory as he bore love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, such beautiful fruit from his Holy Spirit. On an earth filled with liars, cheaters, thieves, conmen, adulterers, uh, perjured per persons, and rebels, there was someone full of grace and truth. I will trust him. Amen. I will believe on him. I will follow him anywhere. This was the response of hearts that were longing for something better than what they had encountered everywhere in this world. Praise God. And so it is to this very day. Do you ever wonder why there is no description of Jesus' appearance in the Bible? We do not know if he was stocky or blonde or, or thin, blonde, or short or tall. Everyone has his guess, but no one knows, right, not even you. First, the Lord did not want men making statues, pictures, or graven images to use as idols or aids to worship. Second, the scripture affords a fully adequate picture of this beautiful man. See him cleansing lepers whom none dare touch. See him showing kindness to women who were generally treated worse than beasts of the field. See him caring for little children, orphans, and widows. See him reaching with compassion to the blind, the starving, the crippled, and the maimed. We may not see his face, but we see his glory. Amen. We see him in Matthew. We see him in Mark, and Luke, and John. We see him throughout all the pages of the Holy Word. And I say, he is beautiful. Behold, behold the man. Amen. Behold the man. Our next stop is Galatians 4, and in verse 1 we read, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, through he, though, he is, or though he be Lord of all. Two thousand years ago the Lord of all came into this world, and through, and though he was the maker of all things, John 1, Yet we find him living in subjection to his mother and obeying the instruction of his foster father, Luke 2.51. Luke 2.51. Let's go there and read that. Luke 2.51. 2.51 says, And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. Though he is the one who gave the law to Moses, we find him submitting to the yoke of the law and placing himself beneath the burden of each commandment, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. And that's in verse 2 of Galatians 4. Just as there is an appointed time when a prince becomes king and apprentice becomes master, 
So there will be a day when the Lord Jesus Christ shall rule on this earth as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But our mystery deepens as we behold the Almighty submitting himself to the decrees of man. <clears throat> Secular. Matthew twenty-two seventeen through 22 and sacred Matthew seventeen twenty-four through twenty-seven, to the conspiracies of corrupt men, John eighteen twelve, to the blows and spitting of sinners, and to the heinous rulings of the unjust courts, Luke twenty-three sixteen through twenty-four. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son made of a woman, made under the law, verse 3 of Galatians 4. Long, centuries of human failure, through one dispensation after another, under a variety of covenants, Jews of every tribe and Gentile, every variety, failed to please God. But time was not uh, merely passing by, it was moving toward a promised end, a hope anticipated and a need met. The coming of the Savior of sinners. There are three great truths in the portion just cited, which we will touch upon now and develop in later chapters. Number one, God sent forth his Son. He did not create, make, or form him. He sent him forth. This speaks with unmistakable clarity of the fact that God the Son predates his birth at Bethlehem. Number two, made of a woman. While the birth is supernatural, God coming to dwell in flesh, it is also natural, a body formed in a woman's womb. Thus, the child that is born is both divine and human. This is not an appearance as he made to Adam, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, etc., but an incarnation. And three, made under the law. As God, he had the power to ignore or circumvent the commandments. As the Lord, he was free to live as he saw fit. None in heaven or on earth could possibly prevent him from doing whatsoever he desired. But he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God, Hebrews 10, 7, and he found it a delight, Psalm 40, verse 8. It is with the third point that we will now be occupied. The only way that Jesus Christ could redeem them that were under the law, Galatians 4, 5, was to become man and place himself under the law and keep it perfectly. If he sinned once, he could not be substitute for sinners, but would have to die for his own sin. If in one instant he came short of the glory of God, then he could not afford offer himself a sacrifice in the stead of others, for he would be as others needing a sacrifice. It is crucial that we understand this truth. The Word became Jesus, not to die on the cross for our sins, but to live a full human life without sinning, so that he could die on the cross for our sins. Allow the Word of God to illustrate Christ, our Passover, is sacri uh, sacrificed for us, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. The children of Israel had been in bondage in Egypt for 430 years. They could have not escape, and Pharaoh was not going to set them free. One, then two, then nine miracle plagues did not move the man to liberate the captives. The Hebrews, through Moses, that he would pass through Egypt and smite the firstborn in every house. He warned them to put the blood of a lamb on their doorposts and promised when he saw the blood of the lamb, he would pass over them. Through that blood, they were saved from death and freed from bondage. Praise the Lord. But that is not entirely correct. I omitted, Brother James says, I omitted something that must be included. For as is the shadow, so is the reality. Read carefully. Exodus 12, 1 through 13, where it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. 
it shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth month of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make you your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, ye shall take it without or take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it and up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the house, wherein they shall eat it. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and pl the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Take heed to these words. Before the blood was applied, before the lamb was slain, before God passed over, before the innocent uh, died that others might live, something had to be done. The lamb was examined to see if it was defective. If that lamb had spot, if that lamb had blem blemish, if that lamb was unfit in any way, then it did not meet the requirements set forth by a holy God. He did not tell the Israelites to take an old lamb, but instructed them to search until they found one without impurity. Forasmuch as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, there can be no defilement in that which accomplishes redemption. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. First Peter one eighteen through nineteen. A lamb was not sufficient, but an unblemished lamb was required. A man dying from men would not be sufficient, but a sinless man could be their substitute. Do you see the reason for his earthly life? He lives as man among men, but remains unblemished. He moves among and befriends sinners without sinning. Luke 7.34 He is made flesh and dwells among the fallen, yet he continues to be pure and undefiled before God and the Father. And in all things he did keep himself unspotted from the world. James 27 Before Jesus took our place in death, he took our place in life. Since all men in Adam have, had sinned, he came as last Adam to be sub the substitute for all mankind, not just in his dying hour, <clears throat> but from the manger to the grave. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus was not merely the Lamb of God, though mere, uh, merely has never seemed more inappropriate, <clears throat> but he was the Lamb without blemish. Recall again the demand for a proper lamb on Passover night. Fast forward to the closing page of the Old Testament. In Malachi uh, 1, 6-8, God rebukes his wayward nation. A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? <clears throat> and if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests that despise my name. And ye say, Where have we despised thy name? Ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar, and ye say, Wherein have we polluted thee? In that ye say, The table of the Lord is contemptible. And if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if ye offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. 
Will he be pleased with thee, or accept thy person? saith the Lord of hosts. The Lord of glory is offended by those who are worshipping him. He is outraged against those who are offering him sacrifices. Why? Because the lambs they bring to him are flawed. Because that which they present in their stead is as defiled as they are. A corrupt sacrifice has no more merit than the corrupt man who offers it. So God the Son was made in the likeness of men and grew from infancy to manhood in a dark and evil world. At last he could say, The hour is come, and he made his way toward the cross. But before the nails were driven into his hands and feet, before he was lifted up from the earth, before he was made sin for us, there must be an ex ex uh, ex uh, examination, sorry, there must be an examination to see if this lamb is a fit sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. First, we will ask the Lord himself. Proverbs 14.5 promised that a faithful witness will not lie. And Revelation 1.5 tells us that Jesus Christ is the faithful witness. We know that he is God that cannot lie. Titus 1.2 so let us hear his testimony. Amen. In John eight twenty eight through 29 we read, Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me. I speak these things, and he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. For I do always those things that please him. I do always those things that please him. Jesus declared, I have not sinned. I have not come short of the glory of God. I believe him. Do you? Amen. I believe him too. And yet we recall that he was made under law. And that the law requires that at the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses... Shall the matter be established? Deuteronomy 19.15 Thus we turn to the leaders of the Jews who hated him, who were moved with envy to try to destroy him. They have spent years seeking to entrap him, to catch him in his words, to find him at odds with the laws of God or man. At last they have their day in court. Now they will lay him low. The tale of their attempt is told in Mark 14, 55-59. And the chief priests and all the council sought for witness against Jesus to put him to death, and found none. For many bear false witness against him, but their witness agreed not together. And there arose certain and bear false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But neither so did their witness agree together. Oh, there were plenty to speak against him, but no two could agree as touching a single charge for all liars. The men who hated him could not find any sin or shortcoming in his life. Right. Next, we shall hear from the representative head of the Gentile power. Ruling in that hour over the kingdom of heaven was Pilate the Roman. He stood before the people and issued the, the striking words, I find no fault in this man, Luke 23:4. The Jews compelled the Roman to take a closer look. He returned and declared, Ye have brought this man unto me. As one that perverteth the people, and behold, I having examined him before you, have found no fault in this man touching those things whereof ye accuse him. Luke twenty three fourteen. Wearied by their insistence, he pleaded with Jesus for some answer as to why the mob so hated a righteous man. He got no reply and returned to say to the multitude of murderers. I find in him no fault at all, John eighteen thirty six thirty eight. Just before consenting to their lust for Jesus' blood, P 
Pilate therefore went forth again, and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. John nineteen four through 6 But it might be said that the Jew and the Gentile were after all only men, and could not see beyond the surface matters of the outward life. Perhaps they missed something of the inward character that would make this lamb unfit to redeem the, rela- uh, the race. We now think with wonder on the fullness of God's plan, for when the man Christ Jesus selected those who would be with him through every circumstance, trial, situation, hardship, and joy of his ministry, he made a peculiar pick. When the Lord chose the ones who would observe him at work and at rest, thronged and lonely, he took into the number a most unlikely individual, Judas Iscariot. Of this man, Jesus said, I have not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil. John 670. It is one thing for Christ to state the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. John 1430. But what would one so wholly devoted to the prince of the power of the air as to be called a devil say about the son of man? In the same hour in which the leaders of the Jews, their witnesses, and Pilate were all finding the lamb to be without blemish, Judas Iscariot offered his testimony. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself, and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple, and departed, and went and himself. Matthew twenty-seven three through 5 Judas declared Jesus innocent. The Lord, common men, religious leaders, political leaders, Jews, Gentiles, and a devil have all looked closely and found no spot in this holy lamb. It is time to behold with awe and wonder as the most perfect and essential examination is made. The Father has sent the Son. The Word has been made flesh to do His will. But the Holy Ghost must now try the reins, search the heart, examine the deeds, see all and know all and judge without partiality and without hypocrisy. And so we return to the text with which we began, 1 Timothy 3.16, And without controversy is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit examines the life of the man of Christ Jesus and declares him righteous. Amen. That lamb is acceptable. That blood can be redeemed. That offering will satisfy. That sacrifice may substitute. Hallelujah. God did not become and die on the cross. Uh, that is true, but not true enough. He became man to be in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin, so that when he died on the cross, he had fulfilled the law for the lawbreakers. He had manifest the glory of God for those who had come short of it. He had lived without sin so that he might take the sinner's place. Behold the man. Amen. All right, well, that was chapter 1. And that title was Justified in the Spirit, Chapter 1. And next time we will cover Chapter 2, which is, let's see how long Chapter 2 is. 43, uh, pages 29 to 43, amen. So next time, Lord willing, we will cover Chapter 2, The Virgin Birth, amen. All right, well, thanks for watching this scope. And I, I know it's a little long, but hopefully you got to... A blessing from it, and if you have not put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, He is the only one that can save your soul. Just as I was saying here, that He died on the cross for our sins, but He did more than just that. He lived a holy, sinless life and kept the whole law so He could do that. Amen. So, hope you'll put your faith and trust in Him and Him alone. 
All right. Well, thanks for watching this Facebook video. And Lord willing, I'll be back next time with Chapter 2, The Virgin Birth. Amen. All right. Well, have a great and wonderful rest of your day. Jesus saves. Believe on him.